Hello, everyone, and welcome to From Survivor to Thriver, episode 32. Uh, very excited to have our guest on today. We're actually staying in Colorado, uh, not flying over any big ponds. Uh, my name is Mark Fernandes. I'm your one of your co-hosts. I'm going to introduce Across the Creek today, my ever sarcastic co-host, Eric DeRosa. Eric, how are we this morning? Good. Happy Friday and nearly the end of August. Interesting little factoid about Across the Creek. So I was riding with a couple of friends this past weekend, and we rolled out of my house on our mountain bikes. They listen to the podcast every week. And I stopped them for a second. And I said, two little points of interest for you. I said, if you look to your left, I said, see that creek right there? I said, that's the creek that Mark and I referenced on the podcast. So it's a real living thing. And then I pointed out your house and I said, Mark actually lives right there. So we're not, we're not making any of this up. These are real creeks. We are, we are real neighbors here in Colorado. So it's kind of funny. It's been, uh, it's actually been a really fun week. Earlier this week, I had the chance to be interviewed on a UK radio show called The Business Of, uh, and the topic was the business of mental health conversations with one of our podcast guests, Wizzy Magnuson. That'll be coming out in September. After today's show, I'm headed over to the Eagle Valley where Dana is our guest today. She's actually living and meeting with the folks from Speak Up, Reach Out, who are doing a tremendous amount of work in the Eagle Valley for suicide prevention, uh, part of the Eagle Valley Behavioral Health System. And then on Sunday, have a really big mountain biking event coming up for Sacred Cycle. So things are things are winding down the summer here really well in Colorado. So no complaints on my end. How are you? Summer can't end soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> things are great though. I've been very busy. I'm getting ready um, to head to our annual pilgrimage back to Long Island. Uh, we always spend... Uh, the Labor Day holiday back there um, with friends and family and looking forward to that and enjoying the cooler nights. Um, it's actually the temperature is moderating enough that I might actually get out on my bike soon. Um, but uh, overall, things are, are quite, quite good. Thanks for asking. I'm excited uh, to chat with our guest today. Yes, she's amazing. And I just wanted to say the nights are cooling down here. Summer's starting to go away but I'm going to throw you right back into the middle of summer in October with 90 degree heat and humidity when you come to the big uh, celebration in Hawaii. So <laughs> yeah, but I don't have to, don't, don't get used to, to it too any, much. I don't have to do anything when I'm there. That's true. That's like, true. And, that's, and, and I think that's the thing that people don't understand. It's like, yeah, if I could like truly live a life of leisure, summer would be just fine, but it, but it's a lie. I have to work my <laughs> ass off and it's like hot and sweat and that they, man, Man, yeah. and the car is always hard. That's I realized that the other day. And we have light. One of our cars is a light colored car, and you know it should be better. But I was like, this is miserable. Like I have to open all the windows and like wait before I can get in my car. I hate that. Yeah, yeah. First world problems for us, though. Let's be honest. Hey, they're still my problems. Okay, don't minimize. That's them. true. That's true. I'll apologize on behalf of empaths everywhere. I'll apologize, and people will understand that <laughs> joke in a second. <laughs> So speaking of guests, our guest today is Dana Neural. Through her personal and professional experiences in healing emotional trauma and navigating life as an empath, Dana's own healing journey has helped her discover her passion and purpose. Over the past 20 years, Dana has worked in various fields of nursing, including pediatric and adolescent mental health, substance use disorder treatment, international medical aid, and trauma program management. Dana is a board certified holistic nurse. She has a master's degree in public health. She is a Reiki master, registered yoga teacher, Akashic records practitioner, chakra mentor. In 2015, Dana started her own practice where she helps people heal using the modalities that were an integral part of her journey, yoga, Reiki, and the Akashic records. As a holistic healing guide, Dana's mission is to guide people to inner connection, healing through the chakras, and living life in energetic awareness. Let's welcome in Dana. Good morning, Dana. Good morning, you guys. It is so wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. 
Uh, we're so excited to have you across the Roaring Fork Valley into the Eagle Valley. <laughs> yes, yes. Eagle is, yeah, we're starting to get that cool fall morning type weather. So yeah, things are shifting for sure. <laughs> Terrific. So great to have you with us. Thank you. Dana, Thank welcome. You. And um, I'm not afraid to share this uh, with our listeners and watchers. We just had a bit of a chat pre-call here before we started recording. And we have a lot to unpack. So we've already discussed yeah. that this might end up a double episode. Um, so this might sound a little different um, or feel a little different to our listeners because we may actually shape the conversation or move away or move into things a little bit differently. So, but don't worry, we're going to hear everything from Dana, guys. It just... <laughs> Um, you might you might have to tune in twice. Tease, <laughs> tease. <laughs> Teaser. Yeah, yeah. I would be honored to be on twice. And um, yeah, there's there's a lot to to my life, a lot to discuss, and I'm happy to do it here with you guys. Well, and I think the important thing to realize is to everyone there is always a lot to unpack, right? But mm -hmm. I. I want there to be equal weight and value placed on your story, plus what you're actually doing is work now. And we've had so many guests on that have um, that have that story in their life. And, and I think, um, unfortunately, a lot of times they're inextricably linked, right? This feeling of whether you're an empath or people who have dealt with trauma and the relationship between them, and then wanting to help others who are struggling um, and you're not the first time I've actually thought that of like, oh, this is actually, you know, these are, these might be two distinct different stories, but for whatever reason, uh, yours struck me even more so that uh -huh. the equal weight needs to be given to it. Yeah. Yeah. So where you. do we want to start? <laughs> um, I guess just starting at the beginning is what makes the most sense. Yeah. Okay, I so, think so. Yeah. So I can just jump right in and I guess, how I like to frame it is, yeah, where where my journey all started or what happened to me. And one of my main traumas in life stems from when I was four years old. Um, my mom was hospitalized and I didn't know at the time, like if you just imagine a four-year-old living in a four-year-old world, I didn't know or understand what was going on with my mom. Come to find out years later when I was older is that she was put into a psychiatric unit. She had schizophrenia. She was also pregnant with my sister at the time. So she went through a psychotic break. She was pregnant with my sister and to kind of protect my sister and also protect my mom, she was put in the hospital. And it was very, it's very scary as a four-year-old, you know, your mom is taken away from you. I kind of, there was some, some drama and traumas going on in, in my home life at the time my parents were arguing a lot and fighting a lot but again as a four-year-old I didn't really understand what was going on and then my mom was taken away and put in the hospital and I didn't understand why and from that point up until my early 20s essentially I learned that mental health that schizophrenia was scary that we don't talk about it we never no one ever told me your mom has schizophrenia this is what's wrong with her. This is what you can expect. You know, no one ever sat down with us, with my brother and I, and had that conversation and explained it to us. And um, I think just in my family, that's how they dealt with things is they didn't talk about things. You kept things quiet. It was embarrassing. It was shameful. It was, you know, kept in the closet, essentially. So, so Dana, how old were you when you actually found out about your mom's diagnosis? I was in my late teens, early twenties. When I found out, I actually went to, I always knew something was wrong with her and I went through nursing school. So I kind of was diagnosing her myself. And then I ended up going to one of her doctors, her psychiatrist appointments with her. And I asked him, I'm like, what does she have? What is wrong with her? And then at that point he told me that she was schizophrenic and it kind of confirmed what I already knew. So, I mean, that's an incredible experience that you were able to ask him point play. Yeah. Do you, this is a very loaded question. Mm. Um, obviously it would be very difficult to explain to a four-year-old what schizophrenia is or uh -huh. how that mm -hmm. would be. But I wonder, you know, in hindsight and knowing the kind of work you do now, you know, what, how do we change that conversation, right? Like, obviously 
you know, one of the things that Eric and I have hopped on many, many times and our listeners and watchers will know this is, you know, if your mom had had a broken ankle or was suffering mm-hmm. from a congenital disease, you would have at least heard the name of it or you would have at least mm-hmm. like, you know, and not... <laughs> Look, I think people get ashamed of everything, right? Like we, you know, no one wants to need help or no one wants to be wounded or injured in any way, but it's just too important to change this conversation. So I just wonder in hindsight, looking back, like how, you know, how could four-year-old of Dana have been better set up and, 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 you know, hell, you could have been a help to your mom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it just didn't exist at the time, unfortunately. And maybe it did, but the people in my life were just trying to survive. You know, my dad was trying to, to take care of two little ones with a third one on the way. He had his own business. He was trying to work full time. He didn't have health insurance that paid for my mom's treatment. So my dad was working full time and we as kids were kind of being shipped around from different family members to different family members while my mom was, was recovering and, and they were trying to take care of her and, and for her to get better. So I think after that initial like survival period, it would have been beneficial to have some child counseling or have somebody kind of come in and just maybe not say, oh, your mom has schizophrenia, but just kind of explain your mom's brain is sick and we're trying to, to help her get better. So I think framing it in a way for, for children to understand instead of making it the scary like thing that, yeah, that, that you learn, that, you, that me as an empath, which I'm sure we'll get into soon, I internalized. And then in thinking that you know something is scary and wrong and embarrassing with my mom, then that means that all that stuff applies to me as well. Well, I mean, when you describe it that way, it becomes like a boogeyman. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it totally you know, was. I, you know, just listening to you as you're saying it, you know, and, and I'll be honest, my experience and there is mental illness in, in my family as well. And I've been very lucky, though society and, and like, you speak well to that, like, we weren't necessarily set up for it. It wasn't, you know, something mm-hmm. that people talked about. But, you know, I can remember as a kid, you know, people didn't talk about diagnosis and such, but, you know, somebody had a nervous breakdown, you know, or, you know, there were all these pieces or ways, but at least, you know, I was lucky in the fact that at least it was in some ways discussed, even though it was discussed in a very sort of, it could be rudimentary or it could be dismissive. And, and just, I'm going to say this because I I can feel it coming from you too. There is a lack of judgment here, guys, like as listeners and watchers, we're not pointing fingers and saying that people behave poorly or did the wrong Mm -hmm. thing. It, 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 it's literally, why we're here you know we're we're having these conversations so that we don't have another four-year-old dana rattling around right now with a sick mom who doesn't who thinks it's some sort of boogeyman and doesn't realize that it's actually you know a clinical diagnosis and there's a doctor working to help you know and and i think that distinction is hugely important yeah absolutely and i always look at it as i don't i don't place blame on on you know anyone in my family as just what I said is that they were doing what they knew how to do best. Everyone is always at every point in their life doing the best that they can. And everyone around me was doing what they knew how to do. So yeah, I don't, I'm not placing blame on anyone or, or, you know, shaming anyone in any way, but yeah, that I'm just, this was my experience. Yeah. One of the things I'm curious about Dana so you were talking about your mom was hospitalized when you were four. Uh-huh. In that ensuing period of you being, as you labeled yourself, a survivor, was your mom in and out of the hospital or was she doing more of just a typical therapy treatment regime during that time? Yeah, she was actually in a hosp- in hospitalized in a psychiatric ward okay. um, for several months until after my sister was born. And then she was released after that. And from what I remember, my mom at that time is that, um, and yeah, there's like pieces and holes missing. My, my memory isn't perfect around this time, but um, I remember her being home and I remember her being like heavily medicated and not being able to like interact with us kids as, as you would 
hope a mom does as you kind of, we have these expectations about how a mom should be. And like, she wasn't a normal mom by any sense. Yeah. Normal. And then go, well, yeah, normal. Air quotes, yes. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we hate that word. Uh, So, and then, so moving forward, you know, did your mom have good and bad periods? Did you have to learn to kind of roll with the roller coaster of what was going on? Did they change treatments and medications? Like how did that kind of manifest itself for you as a child? Yeah, so I, her treatments would change and I know that she she went through a period where I remember where she would just sit at the kitchen table and just smoke cigarettes constantly. And what I did to cope with that is I ran to nature. I was lucky enough to, our home was in this neighborhood where we had all these parks around and we had this big open field in our backyard. And I would just leave the house and go play outside. And I actually, I had a crazy, wonderful imagination and I made friends with the trees, like all the trees around my house were like my friends. And I would go and run and play outside. I would ride my bike everywhere. I would roller skate. So it was intuitively, like I didn't know that I was doing this at the time, but intuitively looking back at myself at that four or five, six year old Dana, I was doing what I needed to do again to survive. I was calling myself back to, to my own mother earth in, in a sense, in a way being outside, being in nature and, and absorbing the energy from the earth was very what I needed to, to kind of get through that and, and deal with all of the trauma and the stress that I was dealing with as a child around my mom and around my family life. So yeah, my mom, she, she's gotten better. She's able to, she actually lives in kind of an assisted living type environment. She has her own apartment right now. She, um, she, is able to go out and go grocery shopping and she is like a functioning person she has a lot of delusions so she she has kind of all these conspiracy like really strange and interesting (laughs) conspiracy theories about about people in her life and and things that people are doing to her um and we don't have to get into that but it's um so it's she's still a part of my life and you know she's still involved but she's much better from from how she was when I remember her after that initial diagnosis and treatment and hospitalization. One of the, I'm so glad to hear. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. one, 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 and one of the things, Dana, that you've just touched on, and we, we're obviously going to go down the whole idea of the empath. And I think, <laughs> you know, empathy versus, you know, what an empath is. So much of your story, and that's why I, I know we're talking about making this into a a longer two-part conversation. So much of your story, especially the nature piece, as Mm -hmm. I was both listening to you, but also sitting and thinking through last night, I was thinking of my own childhood and how I too, when I was young, ran to nature. It was all about me being outside, whether I was outside by myself, outside Mm -hmm. with friends, that's where I wanted to be out in the backyard, wandering around in the woods, playing on my bike, being at friends' houses. It was always being outside in nature. And, and that was kind of the first box last night that I ticked in the empath world. And it became very obvious. And then I started thinking about both Mark and myself, where we grew up, both of us then migrating to New York City, Mark to LA. And then we ended up connecting here in Colorado having not known each other uh, growing up, uh, what Mark, nine miles away from each other. And I don't even, here, I don't even think, yeah, I don't even think it's that far. Yeah. <laughs> and, and here we both are happiest in nature, skiing, mountain biking, running, doing everything we possibly can outside. And so it's very interesting to hear your story as a young child and to see where it's, it's taken all three of us. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what, um, human beings, that's what we need. That's what we need is to be outside and be in nature. And especially empaths, we feel that earth energy. We feel it. We feel replenished after we're outside. So yeah, it's a huge integral part of my life right now as we speak. Yeah. When, when did you put that together? You know, and um, I'm a nut. And so I might jump around a bit. So we'll get there. I promise. But (laughs) the thing that, the thing that, 
I want to kind of tease out is, you know, it sounds like there were sort of these big things you can see in hindsight, but, uh-huh. you know, we've talked about sort of, I'm picturing cute little childhood Dana, like, you know, dirt all over her face, like <laughs> communing with the trees and, and, the, and then fast forwarding to you, you know, being in nursing school and starting to put these things together, you know, when, when did you start to put together your sense of being an empath and how, how you had kind of fed and protected yourself? And, and I uh-huh. love your term of like, you know, people are doing the best they can to survive, you know, and how they did it. And, you know, when, when did you start to be able to turn the corner from like, oh, I'm not just doing this because it feels good or I like it. Like this actually makes me whole. Yeah, I think that that started when I moved to Vail. And that's when I, that was in 2007. So like 14 years ago, I think that's when it all started to coalesce is being here, being in the mountains, being up in nature. And I kept trying to, this is another part of my story. I kept trying to leave Vail. So I came up here thinking I was going to work at the hospital for a ski season and then go someplace else. Cause I was kind of in this travel nurse lifestyle and after coming up here and experiencing a ski season, everyone's like, you need to stay for summer. So I stayed for the summer. And then I kept looking for other jobs. I kept looking for other places to move to. And then finally, after a couple of years, I was like, why am I trying to leave? Everything that I love to do, rock climbing, hiking, cycling, skiing, everything that I love to do is right here. I've made this amazing group of friends. I think it's time for me to start making some roots And through staying here in Vail, that's when I did my Reiki training. That's when I began my Reiki training in 2008. And Reiki kind of turned on, reconnected me to to the energetic awareness. It it made me realize that I had a gift, that I could feel and experience the world in ways that not everybody else could, and that I was really in tune with energy and that I was really in tune with nature. And I was like, ah, all of this nature is right at my fingertips. Like, this is where I need to be. So yeah, I would say it was about 14 years ago. And- Did it? Go ahead. Yeah. And also another integral part, I think, is that physical activity. Cause like what you said, like I knew through high school and like in high school, I was a dancer and in college, I. I continued dancing. I was in a dance company. And so that physical activity was always a huge part of my life. And then when I left college and I lost dance, that's when I started to have some anxiety and, and I ultimately developed a panic attack. And so I started working out and that's when I found yoga. And so I needed, I knew in some way I needed to move my body in a physical way. And so I knew it made me feel good. I knew that it made me, yeah, release whatever. But I, again, I put that connection together down the road when I was like, this is actually like helping me. This is helping me release that energy and process my emotions and other people's emotions that I've been holding on to. It's like the big but, regulator. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It is. So draw, just drawing kind of a, a little thread in the story, Dana. Four-year-old yeah. Dana you're surviving, you're living in California, I, I believe. No, so I grew oh, up yeah. in, in the suburbs of Chicago in Des Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so you're in Chicago and uh-huh. doing your best to survive, not really understanding what's going on, brother, sister, you're all just doing your best. And mm-hmm. at what point did you finally allow this weight to kind of come off your shoulders and I'm guessing it manifested itself in your own type of as you just alluded to your own type of anxiety when you finally took a step back you stopped dancing and Uh said wow (laughs) Uh, yeah yeah so I, I was kind of just yeah going through life and surviving and I always knew that I was shy and I didn't really always feel like I fit in. And I just thought I was like, I could feel there was something different about me, but I didn't know what it was. And so in third grade, I remember specifically being in third grade and this boy in class was getting in trouble by the teacher. I don't remember what he did exactly, but she made him stand up in front of the class and she was 
yelling at him and yeah, not being very nice. <laughs> and I remember being like, I, I'm feeling all of his, emo like I'm feeling what he's feeling right now. Like this hurts, this is really painful. This is scary and he's really sad. And then I remember looking around and like everyone else in class like wasn't paying attention or they were like, you know, didn't seem to care that much. And I remember being like, oh my gosh, like this is, this is really different. This is weird, this is interesting. Like I feel that. So that kind of is just a moment that stands out in my head that made me realize that, yeah, I was different and I was feeling stuff that not everybody else was feeling, but I didn't really now, do much with that. Yeah. Well, the thing I would ask is, you know, here you are. So third grade, you would have been eight. Right? Yeah. Eight or nine. So, yeah. Yeah. So at eight years old, do you, did you, did it make sense or did you find comfort in the fact of like noticing like, oh, I'm different. This is why I'm reacting to the world differently or, or was it, you know, I'm just, I'm wondering, you know, we talk so much about shame and stigma associated with mental illness being different. You know, did you lump it in with the rest of that trauma or was it something, did you already have sort of a keen awareness of it? You know, like this is different, but it's, it's not necessarily bad. Yeah. That. The latter, I think it, I never lumped it into like, oh, I don't like this about myself or, oh, this is gross. And that's something that some empaths do. Some people Absolutely. that- Absolutely, that's why I people, asked. Yeah, some people that feel other people's energy. I hear this a lot in, in my clients is like, oh, I hate this. I hate being an empath. I hate feeling other people's energy. And I never, for some reason, felt that way. I always kind of felt like it was something- like special about me, or I was like, oh, I get you, like, I get you, and I was never, there was, you know, when people were being bullied at school, or, or, you know, kids were making fun of other kids, like, I never participated in any of that, I wouldn't, even though I was in this group of, of friends, and some of my friends would do that to other people, like, I just kind of was like, that's not me, that's not who I am, and I'm not gonna be involved in hurting other people, like, I just kind of always, knew those energetic boundaries and I knew it didn't feel good. So I didn't want to be a part of making other people feel bad. Um, that's amazing. And, yeah. But were you able to insulate yourself though? Cause I mean, that's one of the things that when an empath doesn't understand what's going on, yeah, I can, <laughs> for those of you <laughs> that are watching, you can't see Dana on screen, but I just got the full nod. No, I didn't know how to regulate that. So no. let's talk yeah. about, let's talk about that a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, no, I absolutely didn't. And I think that, again, intuitively, I was doing the things I needed to do to take care of myself. I was outside in nature. I was being physically active. I was keeping super busy and staying away from my home as much as I could. I was involved in all these different sports. And I, I wasn't like, yeah. Um, but I, <laughs> yeah, I, I try to just keep myself busy and keep myself out of awareness because I think looking back in hindsight, I was picking up other people's energies and I wasn't, and I was holding on to them. And I think for a long time, I was holding on to a lot of stuff, including my mom's stuff that wasn't mine until I be, again, be, came into energetic awareness, came into knowing who I was, accepting who I was as an empath and allowing myself to, to release all of that. So I absolutely did not. And I think a lot of, I tend to towards anxiety. And now I know that a lot of times that anxiety is not mine. But I think growing up as a kid in high school and college, I think I had lots of anxiety because I was picking up on other people's energy that wasn't my own. If you could, yeah, if you could probably talk a little bit more about that whole high school college experience. Yeah. I know from I know for me, that was when I really became aware of my anxiety, my OCD really started to rear its head, especially as I moved into college and was living on my own and yeah. didn't have uh, other people who were there looking after me. And, mm -hmm. and, and how did you recognize that it was becoming something maybe out of the ordinary for you? Yeah. So I don't think I really recognized it because in high school is when I discovered alcohol <laughs> and marijuana. And I remember I 
started drinking and partying a lot. And I came into this group of friends who I really love and cherish and they were like super fun, amazing people, but we would go out and just get like annihilated, get drunk out of our minds. And that was my coping mechanism. That was my way again, to get out of my house, to get up away from all of that drama and all that stress and all that anxiety that was in my home and to not have to deal with my own stuff. I numbed, I numbed, I numbed, I numbed. So I, and at the same time, I'm still super busy. Like I'm in all these clubs and, and groups in high school and I'm on the dance team. And then I'm going out and partying as much as I could because anything to avoid feeling or going inward and kind of working through all of, all of my own trauma, all of my own stress, all of the things that I had, you know, back to four-year-old Dana that I had never dealt with. So the question I would ask is how much of this was only in hindsight or when were there sort of dawns of recognition that you were beginning, yeah. you know, I, 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 you know, Eric, was our first guest on the podcast and, and gave his whole story. Mine is only shown up in sort of snippets, but you know, I was in therapy for the first time at age seven, um, uh -huh. again in high school, part of college, and then later. And one of the things that's interesting, even though my family, you know, we were more open about this than many people were, I, I didn't, I didn't necessarily feel shameful or things like that, but I didn't always put together that some of the problems I was having in life or were related to the fact of, you know, either unresolved trauma or things I wasn't dealing with and, and how that led to depression. So I wonder when you started to be able to, you know, cause you talked about being in nursing school and that's when you started to sort of see the lines of your mom's mm -hmm. actual story, mm -hmm. the lines of your story, when did they start to fill in? Was it during that period earlier or, you know, kind of at different times? Uh, so that came in my early 20s after I finished nursing school. So I went to nursing school at University of Illinois in Champaign. And then after I graduated, a girlfriend, a fellow nursing student said, I'm moving to California. Do you want to come with me? And I had this moment. That's, that's where I get the California yes, from. <laughs> that's where California comes from. <laughs> I knew it was in this story somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So I remember specifically, I had this moment where I envisioned my life in Chicago I love Chicago, Chicago, all my, my friends and family are there. Um, I envisioned my life in Chicago and it felt very heavy and very dark. And then I envisioned this potential life in California and it was like sunshine and rainbows. And I was like, yes, I will move to California with you. So I moved to California and I started my first job as a nurse. I was at Children's Hospital Los Angeles as a pediatric nurse. And so I started working full time as a nurse. I couldn't drink anymore. I, I stopped smoking marijuana because you know I couldn't obviously do that while I was working as a nurse. And so I packed up, moved, left the city where I grew up with. I'd never really traveled much at all before. And I broke up with, with the boy, that the guy that I was dating at the time. And so I was in this new place. I didn't have my group of friends that I was always around. I was, you know, kind of, getting lonely and scared. And I didn't have all of, I wasn't partying anymore because I was, you know, had a new career. So when all that stuff stopped, I didn't have a support system. I started to really get anxiety and that led to a full blown panic attack one day after I had been living there for like a few weeks or a month. And my heart was racing and my vision was blurred and I couldn't think straight. I was like, okay, either I'm turning into my mom, I was terrified that I was going to become schizophrenic like my mom, or something is really wrong with me and I need to get help. So we actually had a program, an employee assistant program through the hospital I was working at. So I called them, they got me set up with a counselor, which is really challenging and, and difficult for me to even admit that I needed a counselor because again, at this point, still like no one in my family was talking about about my mom's illness. I had never told anybody that my mom was schizophrenic. And so I started seeing a counselor. And at that point, that's when I like divulged to her all of this stuff. Like my mom's schizophrenic, my parents are divorced. Like I have all of this, you know, stuff going on. And she's like, wow, I'm so glad you're here. And, and I, I just, like, you're I just want to, yeah. 
I just want to tease something out here because this is, I think this is an important part, Dana, for our listeners and watchers. Yeah. Here's someone who's working in the healthcare profession. <laughs> yes. And this is not in the dark ages. We're not talking about like the 1860s here. Okay. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I'm pointing this out because this is one of the things that really fires us up. And this is why we're doing this is you should have had no issue with this. You should have been a person who was like, wow, <laughs> something is going on in my brain. I need a little help. I need to take care of this. And here you are literally like carrying the stigma. Like you don't even want to talk. The way you described that, you didn't even want to tell your therapist what was going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. I was like, oh God, I have to tell her all this. Yeah, it, it was the stigma. The stigma was terrifying to me. And yeah. And up until this point, I'm still, yeah, from my whole first quarter of my life, I'm in my early twenties here. I had not told anybody about my mom's illness or how it affect me or what it was like growing up with that and, or anything. So finally it was just like a purge happened and she recommended that I go to NAMI meetings, which is the National Alliance for Mentally Ill, and that's family members who, like me, who are affected by, by people in their lives, their loved ones have mental illness. And so I started to go to weekly meetings. And at this, the first meeting I went to, we had to stand up in front of the group and say, like, why we were there. And again, I was like, oh, God. And so in this room full of people, I remember standing up and telling them about my mom. And I, I think I had my eyes closed. And when I opened my eyes, I looked around and everyone in the room was crying. And I was like, like it kind of validated that what I was going through was hard and it was full of trauma and stress. And at the same time, I was like, these people, like they, they get it. They understand, they, they feel me and I'm not alone. Like I'm not alone anymore. That's like what I felt like I am not alone in this. Well, and I think that's such an important thing to point out as on both ends of the spectrum, right? So mm -hmm. for those of you that haven't been exposed to NAMI, it, you know, it's specifically an organization for people who have dealt with mental illness in family members or loved ones, people close to them. Um, there's a program um, for people who've grown up with addiction uh, called Al-Anon, and mm -hmm. they're, their journeys are similar. They have very different sort of outreach and how they do it, but it's similar in that support section. But I think the thing that I find so interesting about your story is you essentially had taken all of these steps throughout your life that should have brought you right to a place where you didn't have to stand in front of a group with your eyes closed, um, <laughs> basically hiding, right? I mean, you're still literally like telling your story, but you wanted to hide from it yourself. And it hasn't it hasn't to this point in any way, like you've done nothing wrong. Like you've done nothing except try to accept your mother, try to accept yourself, you know, and, and to have all of this shame and literally like awful feeling being subjected to you on top of the fact, you know, and as we start to weave these things together, our listeners and watchers can probably figure out since we're, you know, 35 minutes in why we think this is going to be a double episode. Um, then weaving in the fact that as an empath, you probably were taking on not only some of what was going on with your mom, but the trauma of your associated loved ones and how mm -hmm. they were feeling, right? And, mm -hmm. and no one's talking. Yeah. I mean, and, and, yeah. and I think, yeah. And I think that's one of the things that when, and I've heard this in so many stories and, you know, Eric just brought it up of, you know, you're not alone, right? Like, you know, there's so many people who have had this situation, but your impression and your experience is not that, right? It's literally like suffering yeah. in silent silos. And I just wonder, when did you realize beyond that, right? Like, okay, now you're not alone. You're in a room full of people who understand, who empathize, who understand what you're going through. But when did you realize that that's where the healing journey starts is actually realizing that this is something that people go through. I think it was at, after that point, 
being in that group and hearing everybody else's stories because you're so right in that it's all self-inflicted really right. you're right I did nothing wrong I I was doing again I was doing the best that I was that I could I was trying to help my mom be, in becoming a nurse I thought in some way like I could help my mom I could make her better and being in that room with other people and hearing all their stories I was like yeah I'm not alone this is this is something this is an experience that, that other people go through as well I think that getting to the point where there was still a lot of of trying to fix, of trying to heal, of trying to, to make everything better all on my own. And that goes again, back to being an empath. That is a common thing that empathic people do is because we feel and we take on and we experience all these, these energies and emotions of other people. We want to fix all of that. We want to heal other people. And I think I hadn't come into that realization that I cannot fix my mom, nor can I fix everybody else until much later. It took me, I went through a huge journey of, of traveling all over the place, being a nurse in, in different states and uh, overseas, trying to fix people. Not until very much later did I finally realize that I can't, I can't. Everyone, you, the only thing you can control in life is are your own actions and I just can't do it. And it was like this huge weight was released and lifted up off my shoulders. <laughs> like it was, it was actually extremely healing for myself and quite therapeutic to come into that realization. So hearing all of this story and I'm, I'm going to throw this out because just to remind everybody that Mark and I are not mental health professionals. We're not, <laughs> we're, <laughs> we, we can't diagnose uh, we can only kind of observe what we're hearing, but I'm just the oh. nut on the top of the almond tree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right, I'm right below you. So I'm, I'm hearing a lot during your younger years, lots of, and we've talked about this on other podcasts, lots of yeah. distraction techniques, right? Being outside, uh -huh. which is amazing in and of itself, but a distraction dancing. Yeah. And then when you were talking about how, when you didn't dance anymore, things didn't feel as well. So dancing is probably a bit of a distraction technique. And then mm -hmm. there's the coping mechanisms of the, the partying Dana, which I'm having a hard time imagining <laughs> <laughs> seeing you and knowing you seeing that, that Dana in high school. So there's all of that happening. And so everything is bottled up inside deeper and deeper and deeper. And what I'm curious about, and maybe you, haven't thought of it or don't even have an answer but did you find that it was more uh, of a release having that first conversation with your therapist or when you actually stood up in front of a room of let's call them peers other uh -huh. people even though your eyes were closed when did it finally feel like you had taken the bottle off the, the top off the bottle of soda that you had shooken up? That moment and standing in front of my peers. Yeah. Coming, building a community, becoming a part of a community. And I think that's so important for, for all of us in so many aspects of healing and in mental health is, is having that support system. Cause I, and that's, you know, I didn't have the support at home. And so intuitively, I found this really amazing group of friends in high school that I, you know, we all really like love each other. And we spent a lot of time together. And in college, same thing, I had this wonderful group of girlfriends that were like my family. And so we find the things that we need in other places. But aha, here in NAMI, in this group of people, it was where I could truly tell my story and be myself and not feel like I was being judged. And not that my friends, I think would ever have judged me. Again, I put that on myself. I was afraid myself of being judged because I felt all of the judgment from all of my other, from my family around the issue with my mom. And so I internalized that for sure. And I, today I know that my friends back then wouldn't have 
have judged me if I would have came out and told them, but I just didn't, I wasn't ready to, I wasn't in that space. And I think that's another part of healing is in hindsight. Yeah. If I would have had all the support when I was younger and then I would have never gotten to that place that I was, but it all is really a part of my journey. And it all has led me up to this point where I am now and doing the work that I'm doing now. So no regrets. So the thing I keep hopping on kind of a similar vein, but it's because I think it's really, really important. And your story kind of illuminates it in a very interesting way, Dana. And as we sort of move towards, I can feel us kind of moving towards where how these things sort of came together to lead to you becoming a healer yourself. But when or how did you realize that the tools to take care of yourself were what you had been looking for externally, right? You had talked about like, I wanted to heal my mother. I wanted to change the feelings of everyone around us. When, when were you able to like look within and be like, oh, wait, actually I have to start with me. Yeah. And these are the steps. <laughs> like how did, that, how did that come out? Yes, I love that question. So for so long, so we talked about all these distraction techniques and then yeah. the distraction became as I was in my nursing career travel. I started traveling and I was going from place to place every three or four months, I was moving to a different major city. And then I went overseas and did work with Doctors Without Borders. And so this whole time, again, I'm just like traveling and moving and not having to like deal with my problems and trying to fix everyone else except fix myself. And then I think it again comes back to that time when I moved to Vail and I had started a yoga practice. I really loved yoga. I, I would find yoga studios and in all of the places that I would travel to and I would go to yoga classes there. And that really felt like self-care. That really felt like I was giving back to myself. Not only was it like moving my body, but it was allowing me to replenish and restore my own energy. And then I did Reiki training. So I was really, I went to this American Holistic Nurses Association conference. Um, the hospital that I was working at in Vail at the time paid for you to go to an annual conference. And I, all of the, of all the conferences to pick from the American Holistic Nurses Association conference stuck out to me. And so I'm like, I'm going there. So we get there and there's all these different modalities, all, you know, aura readings and biofeedback and, and energy work and aromatherapy. And I was like, this is amazing. I've never been exposed to these at all, really. But for some reason, the thing that I kept being drawn to and the talks I kept going to were the, the Reiki talks or the energy healing talks. And so when I came back from that, I was like, I'm going to, to I need to do this. I need to integrate it into my life. And so Reiki is not just for giving it to other people. You can give yourself Reiki. So in learning Reiki 1, I started to give myself self Reiki and it was like, I opened this can of, of beautiful worms or flowers or something. It was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm actually giving back to myself. And this feels really good. It's like this long lost friend or this long lost piece of me that was finally like put back together. That's how I felt when I went through my Reiki training and started giving Reiki to myself. And it was extremely therapeutic and extremely healing. And that's when I, I think that's the moment where you're trying to get at. And that's the moment when it clicked. I mean, not that exact moment, but it was going through that experience and learning more about Reiki and, and feeling all the benefits of energy healing and what it was doing for me. And just for our listeners and watchers, the reason why we're going to split this is the next episode, uh, we're going to talk much more in depth with Dana about her practice and how she's put this into play for other people. But this episode is all about Dana. So <laughs> here is Dana. She's learned how to heal herself through energy healing and Reiki. And without going, you know, we don't need the, you know, the white paper on this, but just for our listeners and watchers, we have mentioned, like we had some people talk about Reiki and energy healing before, but can you take us through just kind of like a, a quick synopsis of what that looks like for yourself it, it specifically? We'll, well, again, we'll have lots of time to talk about how you heal others, but I'm yeah. super interested. You know, here is Dana who's spent all this time trying to fix everyone else around her. And then all of a sudden she's given this tool <laughs> and she's like, oh, hey, this works for yeah. me. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I can only imagine how liberating that must have been. 
Oh, it was extremely li liberating. And so Reiki from Japanese means universal life force energy. So what we know is that everything in the universe is energy. We are energy. Everything around us is energy. Reiki is so simple. And that's one of the things that I love about it the most is it's just a placement of hands. So there's a common misperception. Uh, People think that when they come in for energy healing or they come in for Reiki that you, the receiver, are taking my energy. And that's not the case. The energy is moving through me from the universe into you. And so it's just a placement of hands on different parts of the body. So self Reiki is just putting your hands. It's actually like touching yourself, touching your body in different positions and leaving them there for several minutes. And the universal life force energy, the Reiki is an all knowing energy. It goes in your body where it needs to go. So there's like no thinking involved. Again, it's super simple. You just put your hands in positions and it like does its thing and you're good. And a lot of times um, being very, being in tune with the energy is helpful, but it's not a requirement by any means that you're an empath to experience Reiki yourself. Anyone can learn to be a Reiki channel. You just have to go through Reiki training with a Reiki master. And that is a process that in itself, um, but that process is also very simple <laughs> as well. So, yeah. The way I, you know, I'm a giant nerd when it comes to like sci-fi and stuff. So one of the easiest ways that I've been able to describe it to people is George Lucas, actually, when he made Star Wars, Reiki was sort of the background of the force, right? Now, I'm not, uh -huh. listeners and watchers, Dana isn't like floating things behind <laughs> her. That's not what I'm getting at. I, I'm just talking about the main philosophy of we are all sort of involved, right? Like, and, that, and that's what I'm trying to get to is, you know, it is energy. And for anyone out there who might be like, oh, this is just like, new agey touchy feet no this is science like we are literally vibrating energy like there's no you, you know there's <laughs> i think it's really interesting because it, it i think it's almost a perfect metaphor for the fact that we talk about mental injury mental issues mental health which you can't see and then we try to come up with ways to fix it that are very visible yeah. right yeah. um eric and i have talked a lot about even very good behaviors, if used as distractions, don't actually help. And then, you know, here you come with a very practical, like, oh, we are energy and we need to redirect the energy through us. And people are like, what the hell is that? Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I know, so. exactly. And I think it did take me a while as a nurse in a Western medicine background. It took me a while to be like, okay, how does this work? Like, I feel it. I, I get it. I feel it. But I don't understand it how do I explain it to other people or people are going to think I'm crazy or where's the research behind it there's some research out there about Reiki there's not tons but again it came to that point of just like releasing control and like you know what I don't care you can show works, me a, you can show me a million research studies about saying that Reiki doesn't work and I can be like I don't care because it works for me and I've seen it work for so many other people so what would you, what would you tell the worst cynic? I'm sitting here. I'm but obviously I'm not this, but if I was yeah. like, whatever, I can't see it. That shit doesn't work. What do you tell me? I'd say you need to try it. And yeah. th th a huge thing is if you're not open to it, it's not going to work. And that's with anything. If you get, if you have surgery on your shoulder or on a body part and you're like, this doctor sucks. Who's doing my surgery? This isn't going to work. I hate surgery, blah, 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 blah. It's not going to work. So it's, it's all about your mindset. It really is. So I would say to that person, if you're not open to it, then maybe it's not the modality for you. And I am a strong believer that I love Reiki. I have lots and lots of people around me that love Reiki, but it might not be for everybody. I had, um, yeah, I've had people, the majority of people that come to see me have an amazing experience. And sometimes people are like, eh, and that's okay. That's, it's your preference. It's what works for you. So there's something else. Uh, and I think this might be a really good jumping off point and segue for getting into part two of the discussion down the road. 
but we yeah. we have there's another word that we've brought up a lot in the podcast which goes i think hand in hand with reiki which a lot of people may not actually know what it really means and that is this idea of being an empath and mm-hmm. the difference between and i'd love to hear this you know from you dana the difference between when people talk about you know, empathy, or I'm an empathetic person versus Mm -hmm. what it actually means to be an empath. Yeah. So feeling empathy and experiencing empathy or being an empath are different. So you might be able to sympathize or feel for somebody in a certain situation that they're in. But as an empath, you not only feel other people's energy and emotions, you actually absorb them and take them on. And that can be, it sounds kind of weird and, and, and funky, but it's actually a thing. There's a lot of people in this world, and this is something that I, we can maybe discuss in the next podcast, but this is coming up for a lot of people. And I think we've been as a collective, empaths have been suppressing this for a really long time or ignoring it or avoiding it or having symptoms come up in their bodies and you know, not being able, not having a root cause of, of what's going on with them. And that's because there is this energy around us and there is a lot of energy that needs to, um, we need to kind of decipher what is our energy and what is is somebody else's energy, what is not our own. So empaths actually take energy on in their own bodies and experience it. So for me, for example, I am both an emotion, there's different types of empaths. I am both an emotional and a physical empath. So I feel other and experience other people's emotions. And sometimes I mistake them for my own. So I'll be walking down the street feeling really good. And then all of a sudden I'll feel like sad and depressed and like want to cry. And I'll be like, what's going on? And I've come to the point where I'm in awareness of that and can be like, okay, is this, is this mine? No, this is not mine. And, and I can release it. I can let it go. Physically, I feel other people's pain in my bodies and it, in my body. And it's not like debilitating. Sometimes it can be if, if, it, if it's too much, but when I'm giving someone Reiki, for example, I just get little energetic um, cues. Like I'll feel pain in my low back. And that tells me that that person has low back pain and we, we talk about it, or I'll feel like a pain in my knee. And I know that that person has knee pain. So I actually feel and experience other people's pain in my bodies. But again, it's I've, to a point where I don't let it, it's, I know it's not mine, I can release it, it doesn't debilitate me in any way. Um, so yeah, there's different types of empaths. But the main difference between a sensitive person and an empath is that we actually absorb it into our bodies. It's fascinating so, to hear you. It's super saying, yeah. fascinating. It yeah. is. And, and I can't wait. And you're absolutely right. Like that's um, my ulterior motive for the deeper discussion is I want to talk so much more about your practice and how that sort of evolves. I'm going back to you though. <laughs> and I want to, I, I would like a little bit of insight on how you utilize Reiki healing for yourself from a mental perspective, this is, I'm very curious about this. For mental, emotional healing. So yeah, it's all connected. It's a holistic practice. So if I feel very stressed or anxious or whatever, then I'll, I'll just start doing the Reiki hand positions on and go through. There's like a, a certain process that I go through to give myself a self Reiki treatment. So yeah, I, when I need it is when I give it. And I also give myself a little bit of Reiki every night when I'm just lying in bed before I go to sleep at night, I'll put my hands on my root chakra and it'll just help me have a good night's sleep. It just is kind of my self-care routine. So it's this tool that I pull out and use when I'm having moments of stress or, or anxiety or yeah, emotional stuff is going on, then it's absolutely something that I can use. And it's, um, I integrate it with other things as well. I love doing Reiki outside. I have a 
porch in my backyard and a nice little cozy lawn chair. And I love to just lay on that lawn chair and, and give myself Reiki outside. I love to meditate while I'm doing Reiki. So I, I kind of have incorporated different modalities into the Reiki that I give myself. Yeah. So something I'm also really fascinated about right now, and I can see when you talk about it, how Dana of today says, oh yes, I can, I'm walking down the street and I recognize that I'm feeling sad and depressed. Oh, that's not mine. I can put that aside. How long and when, when were you actually able to decipher the difference between your own physical and mental anxiety and depression and things related to your childhood trauma versus mm -hmm. what you were taking on from other people? Yeah, I think that all came through in my Reiki master training. So there's three levels of Reiki. Reiki one, Reiki two, and then Reiki master and Reiki master is more intense and you learn how to teach other people uh, or you learn how to train other people in Reiki. So in that process, I was working more intensely with my own Reiki master and working with other people. And so that really helped me like, and that's when I first noticed or became an awareness that I was a physical empath because I'd be giving Reiki and I'd be like, feeling a pain somewhere. And I'd be like, do you have pain there? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, huh, okay, this is really interesting. So through like that process of coming more in depth into my own Reiki practice and training is when I learned to start to really decipher what's mine and what's other people's energy. And then that translated into emotional stuff. So a lot of times when I'm giving Reiki to people, especially when I first start, like I'll feel their, I'll feel anxiety. That's the number one reason why people come to see me for Reiki is for anxiety. And so a lot of times the first hand position, when I'm working with somebody, I will feel that anxiety. I'll feel their stress, their anxiety. And I, and it's, there's always a moment where you're like, Ooh, okay. I'm feeling this. I feel stress. I feel anxiety, but is that mine? And intuitively, I know that it's not. And generally in that, when you're in that sphere of I'm the giver and this person is receiving, it's again, it's like this, it just flows. It just knows the Reiki energy knows what it needs to do. And there's also like this boundary where it's like, they're not going to get any of my stuff. I'm going to get little cues as to what's going on with them as to what I need to know to help them heal. But it's, again, I don't take it on. And it's just being able to, after, it's been many years, I finished my Reiki master in 2015. So it's like, I've had several years of practice. So I would say just going through my Reiki training helped me just learn to decipher the difference between my energy and somebody else's. I mean, the way you describe it, and, and I've heard other Reiki masters talk about it this way, is it is more of a sense of like a conduit or a channel yes. versus, yeah. yeah. Um, so as we sort of wrap up part one here, the thing I want to ask, and I think it's related to what Eric just asked, is looking back now in hindsight, how often do you feel that the anxiety or other issues or other feelings you had come up were related to this confusion of what was yours and mm -hmm. what wasn't, you know, I, I'm just yeah. imagining four year old through 20 something Dana, literally taking on, you know, cause that, that's the yeah. part of it that I think is difficult for some people to understand as a true empath is like literally the shit is happening to you and uh -huh. you know, you're, you're feeling it for real. It's not this like, Oh, I feel bad. It's like, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. I am bad right now <laughs> yeah like, you know so looking back how often do you think you were in the grips of that and not even realizing it yeah I think looking back I think it was just a mixture and it's hard you know looking back and not being there in that moment it's hard to decipher like what I was really taking on that was other people's and what was really my own but I think you know kind of those main points in my life when I was four years old I think probably the fact that I didn't understand what was going on, but I was feeling, I think I was absorbing a lot then when I was younger. And then when I was in my twenties and I moved to California, I think half of it was unresolved 
stuck trauma and emotions. And half of it was probably being in this new place and experiencing all these different energies and that being like, just magnifying my experience and causing this tremendous anxiety and, and a panic attack. So I think looking back, it's, yeah, it's hard to decipher what exactly was what, and I think it was a mixture, but probably, this is a good question. Probably when I was younger, I'm thinking it was mostly other people's stuff that I was feeling. Well, I mean, I'll be honest. I jumped to that conclusion, just thinking of what was going on in your family and home life, right? You know, I, you know, we've talked often about inherited trauma and, you know, even, um, certain things that can happen and, you know, that there's been studies and proof that, you know, chi- children, even with from the womb, can take on family and generational trauma and there's all these different pieces. So just imagining, sitting here listening to you talk and me imagining like little Dana, I'm like, there's no way that that wasn't, you know, that you weren't a conduit and taking on all these mm-hmm. things in that way and that there's no way that it wasn't affecting you, you know. Yeah, absolutely. That's so insightful of you. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> well, something, uh, and, and Mark's- <laughs> it's, I don't Mark's, know why you keep Mark's, around. Yeah, Sometimes Mark's, I <laughs> Mark's great at this, and that's one of the one of the many reasons I keep him around. <laughs> but, and maybe this is somewhere where we might just leave this conversation, because what just popped into my head as you both were speaking about that, and I was thinking back to some of the things I was- uh, reading through last night. So here's one of those questions that we can always ponder is, do all empaths suffer some type of mental illness? And does everyone that has mental illness, are they an empath? It's an interesting... <laughs> yeah, that is super interesting. And I've never thought of it that way and I'd love to ponder that question absolutely that is really that's a good one (laughs) I'll be honest I love I love to jump to really uninformed conclusions and the thing that I would say the thing that I would say is I was very lucky my mom when I was very young knew that I would feel all the feels you know for lack of a better term you know I was just a very passionate you know I was prone to joy rage all the things And I don't think she understood whether or not I was an empath or not, or those things, but it was never, I was allowed to sort of go down those paths, right? Like it was never like shortcut or, you know, oh, you know, what you're feeling isn't real. Like, you know, it was like, yeah, go ahead, freak out. You know, my mom would even sometimes she'd be like, oh, you're having a freak out. Great. Go in your bedroom. I don't care what happens in there. You know, there was space for that. And I wonder if at a young enough age, if there's enough education about it, that if someone is told they're an empath, right? Like literally, if you think about it, you could be like, wow, I'm crazy, (laughs) you know, (laughs) just being an empath and not realizing it, right? Like think about, you know, our listeners and watchers, imagine walking down the street and someone walks by you, you're completely distracted, you're in your own world. And all of a sudden you have this impending feeling of like doom and anxiety come over you. And you're like, well, where the hell did that come from? If you have the awareness, as Dana does of like, well, I'm an empath, like, oh, that person might be having the worst day of their life that just walked by and I just took that on. If you didn't have that, you'd be like, well, I am nuts, literally. Mm -hmm. I just like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, so I do wonder, and and, and I think that's why, Eric, you and I are so hell-bent on this conversation is talking about it, the awareness of it changes it. I do think that's an important question and it's an interesting sort of, link lack for a better term and something i look forward to we can definitely go into some depth of of your experience with that and i'm really excited to have you back on because i feel like we've gotten a wonderful impression of the person dana and your story and how you ended up here and now i you know i invite you all to come back for the next time we have dana on because now i really want to hear about your journey as a reiki healer and and how that has sort of informed this like next chapter and you know I didn't um full disclosure to the people listening and watching you know when we started to think about this I was like I don't I didn't want to shortchange either side of this because I feel like um the work you're doing is really important and I think I'm totally drawn to your story because 
along the way, there were all these pieces and parts. I mean, I just, the image of you as a mental, as somebody who needs mental health help working in the medical field and like not being able to do that. Like I, I'm like, that's the fucking problem here, Pete. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it totally um, is it totally is and 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 it makes me really scared for what we've all gone through in the past 18 months during the pandemic because there are so many mental health professionals that we're literally grounding down to a nub as we speak and i know they're not getting the support and the help they need to continue mm-hmm. the work that they're doing and many of them love their work and this is what they want to do and i and i i can only imagine what they're going through in some ways. And what I've heard from some of them is just the absolute mental collapse and fatigue that's going on. So it just, mm-hmm. it just seems to me such an important conversation. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And there's yeah, and more I, that we can dive into. And, and, I, and you know, thinking through it myself, having Dana on is such an important piece of this collective trauma that, as you just alluded to, Mark, everyone around the globe has been going through now for 18, 19 months. And it's, as we see in the news every day, it's continuing, it's not getting better. And to hear the survivor piece is such an important part of now understanding how to become a thriver. And I think what Dana can really help with is, I I know just kind of thinking through it myself last night and starting to put even more pieces of the puzzle together. And that's what I love so much about this podcast is not only the opportunity we have speaking with guests and sharing stories and helping one person at a time, but it also helps me put more and more pieces of my own puzzle together. And and I think there's so much more to this conversation, not only for the three of us that are you know, on the podcast today, but there's so much amazing information and so much help uh, that you can provide Dana to people, as Mark was saying, who are out there right now, because we're all going through this collectively. And if it can help kind of one person recognize, yes, I'm feeling that way. Maybe, you know, going to a NAMI meeting, maybe speaking to a therapist, maybe just going to a Reiki practitioner uh, and having a, that person put their hands on me and we have that energy transfer and I'm able to find some sense of uh, immediate relief to begin the healing process. I think there's, there's so much more to the story. So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave. I'm going to hand it to you, Mark. Well, Eric, thank you so much. Eric DeRosa, my co-host on From Survivor to Thriver. This is episode 32. We haven't decided if we're going to do an A and a B or if you're going to get another number yet, Dana. Um, (laughs) And Eric, unfortunately, will be in charge of organizing our schedules for another recording session. And just as a tease for everyone who's listening, um, the focus on the next episode with Dana is really going to be about her practice and how she's utilized all of the experience you just heard about and how she's using it to heal others, um, which I'm super excited uh, to learn more about. Um, I guess it's really just been selfish. I was like, I, I want to hear the whole story and I want to hear all that. So um, you guys have to listen to the three of us again because I thought that was important. So, oh, well. <laughs> Dana, do you have any, uh, anything else you'd like to share or any um, parting words before we say goodbye? Or anything no. you want our listeners to think about. Oh yeah, you can tease, you can tease. You can tease heading into the something for them to maybe think about in their own journey before yeah, they hear part so, two. Yeah, absolutely. It's It's been such a pleasure and an honor to be on this podcast. Thank you guys for having me. And I just like our listeners to maybe give some thoughts to um, what are my empathic tendencies or am I possibly an empath? And there's lots of quizzes you can go and take online. There's lots of books out there about being an empath. So um, maybe just do a little self-exploration about how, what, where your energetic awareness is right now. Like how in tune are you with the energy that's around you? And it is a real thing. I have people who come to me all the time and they're like, okay, I have to tell you something really weird. I feel other people's energy. And I'm like, you're in the right place and you're not alone. So, so know, I guess that you're not alone, 
There are lots of us out there. And if you're curious or you want to know more about what I do, you can go ahead and head to my website. It's just dananeural.com. And for those of you not watching, that's D-A-N-A-K-N-E-R-L.com. Um, I will definitely be going over there. I will be a lot more informed for our next <laughs> uh, meeting. And Dana, I cannot thank you enough. Um, so for Eric DeRosa, my co-host, Dana Neural, myself, Mark Fernandes uh, from Survivor to Thriver, episode 32, uh, teasing in the next time we're going to have Dana in. Um, I will leave you with these words, as I always do. Let's all please be as well as we can. Oh.